Thanks for the introduction. I uh, hope I will be able to talk about some things rules. Um, and also, I think so. Learning for learning production settings, so what we're going to use it for. I hope Katie will have talked about it yesterday already. Um, about can I switch for here? So, what we get is a metadata, and we want to make use of, use of it for customer engagement and for insights. And what I'm going to talk about is how how do we make how do we evaluate uh, the data to to get um, to get more insights of it. And I mostly focused today on um, data which has a resolution around what we call high resolution. So let's say 10 seconds. We so because we're operating on with many different utilities worldwide, we might have different different uh, resolutions. Some people might have eight second data. Some people might have the better. Thank you. Um, some utilities might collect eight second data. Some might collect two second data. Right now, we're focusing on let's say a common standard of 10 second data, where we have both um, a significant number of um, people that are interested in deploying the data and also significant. <coughs> A uh, number of data sources like uh, the replicas. <coughs> Let's introduce this very nice data set. Um, so, what is plotted here is for one day um, for some typical household, the power consumption. So, the x axis is uh, time of day, and the y axis is the power consumption. And obviously, this looks maybe for someone who hasn't seen it before, first of all, a little bit cryptic. And we want to make some sense of that, such that we can say, hey, customer. Uh, your utility bill is not just 100 bucks, but 10 bucks went to the fridge, and maybe 20 bucks to your washing machine, and all the rest went to your completely inefficient ecological system. And in order to do that, that's, I think, what we're going to use Node for. And so, what I want to start with is show some signatures of actual appliances, which make it clear that it's actually possible to disaggregate the signal into something more meaningful. Because obviously one requirement is that different appliances do have different signatures or different are somewhat distinguishable. Um, so let's start with um, some appliance intelligence. So we're a very famous one and also one which is very, in some sense, very easy to disaggregate is, is uh, the washing machine um, because it has so, so many interesting features which you can look at. Um, so the washing machine starts here at the beginning with um, some heating cycle. So this is currently not a cold cycle, but um, it's maybe 60 degree cycle. And it looks like that, uh, where the water in the washing in the washing machine is just heated. So that that's usually also the part which consumes uh, the largest amount, amount of energy, and is in that sense the most significant part. However, thus this heating cycle in itself is not super significant. So there are a lot of other appliances which might have a similar uh, similar heating block somewhere. So it could be, I mean, it's maybe a little bit long for a kettle, but it could be some some other. Maybe even this space heater which is running for ten minutes or twenty minutes could look very similar. Um, what makes it very obvious that this is a washing machine is that there are some additional features. And use the cursor at the point. Okay, what? Use the cursor at the point. Ah, it where is it? Can't see. Wait, wait, it's there. Use the trackpad. So you... Ah, here. Yeah, yeah, point, okay. point like that. So Excellent. Side. Thank you. That's a good idea. Thank you so much, Olga. Um, so we have we have the heating block here, which I just talked about. Um, but we also have additional features to identify that this is a washing machine, um, and which is some, for example, um, the um, these sort of noisy spikes which are around here, which are just the drum of the washing machine spinning around, and they are this like accelerating, decelerating. So it is, there is some variation in the power consumption. And to the end, uh, we can see that the power consumption rises again. And that's because usually you want to get rid of the water, so you have to spinning at the end, uh, which increases the power consumption. And these are, let's say, three pretty distinctive features of the washing machine, which make it this appliance. You can, we can detect that with very high uh, precision and very, very high recall, <coughs> recall rates. Um, another one would be a dishwasher which um, is mostly con composed of two heating blocks, sometimes three. Um, so one would be here, then there's maybe a shorter one here, and um, then in the end, another one here. Um, so, and the typical duration here is something like one to two hours for how long this dishwasher runs. Um, one, one interesting thing that we can already see in this appliance here is also in the signature here, is that it's not, sometimes, I mean, this whole NERM algorithm it's not a super precise science. 
So it's not always, there's not always a unique solution to that. I think some of um, the speakers before also mentioned it before. In this case, it's not clear whether this spike here, whether that belongs to, whether that power consumption belongs to uh, the dishwasher or whether it was a kettle, something else. Um, but roughly that's how the dishwasher looks like. And then a third one might be a tumble dryer, uh, which is, first of all, takes quite a significant amount of energy um, because it has so much to get rid of the water in the closets. And um, so it's one thing that's typical for, I mean, there are a couple of different types of tumble dryers that work in different ways. But one pretty common one has these, these typical dips in the power consumption here, where apparently when I think when, when the clothes get drier, then it doesn't have to heat up that much anymore. So it just, just goes into some cyclical operation mode. Um, so yeah, and so the main takeaway from these three slides about three maybe rather important household appliances is that we can, these appliances do have distinctive signatures and there should be an algorithm. At least we as humans can, can see that they are different and there should also be an algorithm, if we're a little bit optimistic, that can do the same. Um, so then again, the challenge is we have this aggregate reading and we want to separate it out um, into hopefully useful um, outputs, which are, for example, shown here in red. This would be for these three appliances. Um, again, this is one data that's shown here. And we can see that the washing machine, apparently, I think there were three washing machines, <clears throat> three washing machine runs, one here, second one here, and the third one here. And then in total, the energy was predicted to be 2.8 kilowatt hours. And then additionally, I think there are also three runs of the tumble dryer, one here, second one here, and third here, uh, with a total power consumption of uh, 2.48 in this case. And probably also a dishwasher. It's a, bit, a little bit difficult to see. I think one element is here and another one here. So yeah, we're looking for an algorithm to do that. And um, yeah, when I started working on that, I was just, when I looked at a problem, I thought that, I mean, obviously there are a lot of ways how you can tackle the problem. And one, I think very historically very famous one is that you do ed edge detection and, um, or event detection, where you say, okay, we have maybe for the washing machine here, for the heating element, we have some on element where the power, spy, uh, power consumption jumps up by two kilowatts. And then we try to look at, okay, where's the next off edge where it goes down again, we try to match that. And then we can, can make a cluster out of that and say, okay, this is the peak power, this is the duration, time of day. Um, however, if we, if we stay with the example of the washing machine, we can see that this is not the only feature that's available. There are more features available. There's also this noisiness, there are, there's a spinning cycle, um, which it's, it's possible, but it's pretty difficult to hard code that. So if we, if you want to, if you were to, um, uh, do that sort of by hand, by writing code in which exactly describes how does the noisiness of a washing machine look like, it's possible and we've, we've, we've worked on that as well, but it's, um, it's pretty challenging because there are also a lot of different washing machines around and then exactly to describe what, what's the difference sort of to describe but sort of by hand in code the difference between the washing machine noisiness and some other noisiness which could arise from some other appliances which are just randomly running the day it's pretty difficult and um so i was looking at that how can we do it better and i thought like deep learning is obviously just super impressive progress that has been made there where you go away from from making a handmade description of what what your signature looks like or what your object looks like towards you teach the algorithm more like you would teach a child how something looks like, right? So you, you don't have to do, have to describe any more. I mean, I think one very famous application that is uh, set driving cars, which will, as far as I see it, to so, at least for, for some components, definitely make use of uh, deep learning to, to learn how does the environment look like? What constitutes a, a, um, a cyclist or a, a pedestrian where we might have very much tra training data on how how do people behave like nobody's ever going to drive over a, a, a cyclist or something like that so there's probably something to avoid but it's super difficult to to hire a bunch of engineers and describe how could a cyclist look like in all sorts of different conditions in sort of different colors and different weather um and with what we can with deep, do with deep learning and what i'm going to show now here is um so our work was very much inspired there by the visual component where you take um, for, for, let's say, image recognition, where you take convolutional neural networks 
And the idea of convolutional neural networks is that you, you say there are some abstract features in the data which are, which are sort of universally valid. So if, for example, if you stay with the example of the washing machine and uh, um, uh, the heating cycle, then it doesn't matter whether this heating cycle occurs at 3 a.m. at night or at 8 p.m. in the evening. It's sort of the same, same thing. And that can, that's what you encode in the convolutional part of it, that you say whatever, whatever happens at any time of day um, in terms of, um, let's say, raw, raw feature detection should also be valid at another time of day. Um, and so if we look broadly at our architecture here as an input, we most exclusively in the moment operate on daily input data um, because it's also how we give feedback to users back again. So we want to know what happens in, in one day. That's the input. And then we have multiple layers of convolutional uh, followed by um, max pooling layers. And that's in the end then again connected together with a fully connected layer. And this fully connected layer also has more the ability to learn something maybe about the behavior of people which might mean that typically you're not going to run your washing machine at 3 a.m. At, 3 a at night. So if it's something what's running there, then maybe that's just as likely to be a washing machine. Um, and these are <clears throat> thousands of things. And again, the output could then, the end output is um, shown below here. Just a couple of examples. Uh, right now we have, I think, roughly eight appliances which are operational. And we can predict different things. So we, we can predict um, the energy per day, um, also a classification, did it run, yes or no? And also over longer time periods, do we think that this household owns this appliance and how often do they use it? Um, and back to one day, when did they use this appliance? When was start and when, when was stop time? So, Yes, that's our sort of sort of conceptual architecture, how we work with deep learning. And I think what's also very powerful about it is that we just, at the, at the input here, at the top, we just can input a signature, and at the bottom you, uh, sorry, at the input you put in what you want to disaggregate, and on the bottom you just put in the output, and we don't have to do that much work about describing how the signature would work. I think that's pretty cool. Um, this next slide shows how going down the network, we, the, the, the architecture or the neural network learns more abstract representations. So if the input is just the, um, the one day of time series, then the first layers might just learn what's an edge, and the higher layers below that will, uh, will learn more complex features like what is the heating element, or what is the spinning cycle, or what is uh, a piece of noise, and then even a layer below that, what is a washing machine? A washing machine is a heating block and some noise and a spinning cycle in the end, and so on. And um, the last layer, the, the, the fully connected layer, will say, how does that fit all together? Um, yeah. So also, I'm not sure whether you noticed, but when we were designing this algorithm, we thought, like, how, how can we name it? And so even, it's even interesting if you, if you do <coughs> deep learning, like, and it doesn't work. Like, how do you figure out what went, what went wrong? And we came to the conclusion that it's sort of um, that it's um, we always were thinking more about it, like why does this algorithm think that there is a washing machine? Why does it think there is a dishwasher? So I thought we should also give it a human name, and thought that uh, Diana would be appropriate, like deep neural network with some um, characters inserted. And that's actually also when we when when we I mean mostly it works extremely well, but if something goes wrong. It's typically because we trained Diana wrong. So we showed her some wrong examples, and um, that just means that we have to, to check what, what went wrong in our, our schooling. Um, yeah. So this would be an example of um, how this actually works, another one. So we have um, a rather quiet household, actually, where there is, I think there are two or three fridges running in the background. You can see that. And um, three appliances running. So in the morning, there's a dishwasher. Actually, if I look at this now, I think this is a um, synthetic um, piece of data that we created. I'll come to it later. Because one thing that is very important if you want to train these deep learning architectures, you will need a lot of training data. So you might say there, is, the Diana is sort of intelligent, but also she's very stupid because you have to show her a lot of examples until there's some useful result coming out of it. 
And this is one example where we just took separate signatures and like munched them together through a random or synthetic household. And three appliances running here. So one dishwasher, one washing machine, and one oven. And I'm not sure whether it's visible here, but the energy is mostly correctly um, predicted. So there, I think the truth is here 400 watt hours for the day for the washing machine. And what's predicted is what 530 watt hours, which is um, sort of understandable because there's some other stuff going on here. Dishwasher is captured as well. And what's also interesting is um, there's an oven running here and the oven can be, and these some ovens could be confused with a tumble dryer, but it's, that's not happening here. So the tumble dryer is correctly predicted to be zero. Um, one thing also, which is, I think at this point here interesting is if you look at the washing machine, if you look at a bit closer at that, you can see that um, the clear signature here plotted in blue is just very quiet here, while in the total aggregate um, channel, you can see there's probably some other appliance which just goes on here. So there's some, some additional block here, which could be a spinning cycle of the washing machine. And which again sort of shows the inherent uncertainty in this disaggregation, which is not, not completely clear whether it's a washing machine or not. That's also the reason why we have a little bit higher prediction here. And this made us convince us that it's very important to treat, to treat this inherent uncertainty correctly, such that when we feed back these results of our algorithm, first of all, to our product team, but also later on to uh, utilities, to give them a feeling of like, how confident are we in this measure? Because it's not super helpful if we say, okay, um, this washing machine has a predicted energy of 532.68 kilowatt, or not watt hours in this case, um, however, there is a large error bar around that. So that's why we also have thought how we can um, how we can best treat this uncertainty. I think we found a pretty cool solution there. And the results are shown here for a um, for a dryer, uh, where in blue is the uh, the plug level consumption. So every data point here would be one um, uh, one day of this irrigation results for I think a couple of homes and they are sorted by the size of the error bar. And you can see that there are a few events here, or like actually a couple of events, where we have a fairly small error bar around that and where we can make, even per one event, a very accurate, uh, give a very accurate number of what, how much energy was consumed for, for this event. And there are also a lot of events here, more on this side, where there's a very large uncertainty bar around that. And that's typically the case if you say you have a very busy home where there is a tumble dryer running at the same time, there's a space heater running at the same time, people running their kettles and so on. And it's just sometimes not clear whether they might just have the same peak power, for example, and it's not clear whether this block of energy belongs to a tumble dryer or something else. And so obviously we're working, or obviously, but we try to, when developing this technology, we try to make it fit for different use cases, end use cases. One end use case is just giving our customers and our, our utility and customers a good um, overview of what was their monthly bill breakdown. So how much energy went to, to washing and to laundry. And for that purpose, you can even use these high uncertainty events and just sum them up over the whole, uh, whole month and you will still come to some sort of useful figure. Um, however, if you want to tell someone, hey, your last washing machine run or your last dryer run was um, 1.5 kilowatt hours, then you probably can't do that when you have these high error bars around here. So that gives us, an, to even to just measure the uncertainty, it gives us an um, opportunity to filter on that later on and to select like, okay, the high high precision ones we can we can use for, for very detailed feedback and the lower precision ones, we just have to average over a longer time period. So I think it's pretty cool. Um, Next thing I want to show, talk about is uh, solar, because I, I think also as some people have mentioned before, it's pretty common these days that people install solar panels and also that they are using this electricity that's coming from the solar panels for their own self-consumption. And this means that the solar production is completely mixed up with, um, with the um, consumption. And um, what's shown here is just one day, which is a rather quiet day. I think there is, we can see this fridge running probably all the time and some other appliance which goes on and off. And then during daytime, the power consumption goes negative. So that means the house produces more energy than it, um, than it consumes. 
um, I think what's interesting here is if you look at these events here, this is a cloudy day because if it would be a clear day, we would see a curve which somehow goes like this here. So it would just be, you know, it would peak at, at midday and um, it then would just be a continuous slope like thing. However, if it's more like a day in, like in UK or in Germany or some other more like cloudy and rainy uh, climate, you will have very often you will have clouds which will manifest itself in this way. So um, like here, probably it just went from, from sunny to cloudy. And then you have, see, you have these um, yeah, apparent increases of the power consumption. And what's very difficult here is for an algorithm is to tell the difference between was this piece of blob of energy, was it a cloud, which has re uh, led to a uh, reduced PV power production, or was it a kettle or a space heater or something? <laughs> and um, for a long time for us, it wasn't clear how much progress we can make on that because they're, they can look very similar. So I want to show a couple of images in the future, uh, next slides, a couple of figures which show what can be done there. Um, so this is a slightly more complicated day where we again have uh, the solar power generation here, but then also two appliances uh, running, which one is a washing machine here and a dishwasher here, um, which I think is pretty cool that this works because it shows that the algorithm is not, Diana is not confused with all the noise that's going on here um, and all, all the things. But it's still, if you look at it by the eyes also, so for us as humans, pretty obvious that this can be, that these events can be told apart. Um, then I have another example, which I think is uh, more impressive, where the washing machine is actually running during, during daytime, so in the middle of the day, so around uh, between um, 11 and uh, 13, um, roughly. So it's uh, it's maybe a bit difficult to see here <coughs> because it just looks like a, a like a big mess here, right? So this is just a, a day where there's always clouds coming and going, and then there's again a clear sky condition. Mm. And the blue lines here show the start and the particular stop time of that washing machine event. And yeah, it's not super obvious to see from this perspective that this is actually right. But if we go zoom in. And then we can see, so this is just a, a zoom in now in the middle of that bay. And we can see here, these are just the cloud events. And here in the middle, you can see there is a little, more, a little bit more noise and also a very steep curve here, uh, a steep um, edge, which shows the heating element of the washing machine. And yeah, then it's a bit noisy. And I think this is probably the last spinning cycle of the washing machine. And yeah, Diana also gets the stop time there, pretty correct. And um, yeah, I just thought that's pretty cool to see that with this deep learning technology, I think you can, if you have enough signatures and enough data, you can sort of go to the edge of what is in the data. So you get everything out there. Obviously there's this, the accuracy of uh, appliance detection during solar hours is reduced because there is just more noise around it. But I think with this technology, we can just get everything out of it that's in there. That makes sense. Um, yeah, so that's that. And maybe one important point is how do we train this? Uh, probably has meant, we mentioned before that you actually do need a lot of trained data to, to facilitate that. Um, I think we are at a lucky position with Anzo that we have collected, been collecting data for years and years. I think since Katie knows better, but probably since 2009 or something. So we have some, uh, some database to play with. However, also our first um, experiments there were a little bit difficult. So what's shown here is in, um, and the uh, plot below is um, we have trained the first, uh, first trials on real data, so on real aggregate me measurements um, from, I don't know exactly how, how many there was, but it were probably like 10,000 days. And um, then I just try like, how does it perform? And I try to characterize that. And one test that I did is I, I just took this snapshot of a dishwasher and it shouted, showed it to Diana at different times of the day and looked at the output. And that's what plotted, plotted in uh, uh, the colored, um, oh, sorry, the colored one on the bottom here. And what we would expect is that the dishwasher, the output should be the green curve here. And that should always be, ideally should be a flat line around 1.2 or 1.3 kilohertz. However, if you look at it, first of all, it's very, it was very noisy. So it was oscillating around here all the time. And even there were some, some times of day, like what is it, 5 a.m. in the morning here, where um, the dishwasher was, uh, was uh, predicted to be a washing machine. Although there was nothing else there. So it was just the, 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 the dishwasher shown. 
And this just showed that with this training data, apparently Diana never never saw a dishwasher running between three or four and six a.m. So I thought like that can't be true. There must be a washing machine if, if anything runs there, which is probably not very not a very good or a very scalable solution. And just show that it's very important to augment your data and to even if you have what you thought would be a big data set already, you just even have to then have to think about like how can you how can you make it um, yeah how can you make it even larger. And what we've what we're doing there is just synthetically building households up and mixing that that together with uh, with real data, such that also edge cases like washing machine running at midnight or in some crazy day of part of day is correctly um, correctly being captured. And um, another thing which I think was pretty interesting, I think these examples are actually from the Reddit data set, if I'm, if I'm correct. If I'm correct. So I think mostly it's a really super great data set, but now I actually will show two things which I found pretty interesting. And there's were, uh, there was a tumble dryer, and maybe it was also our mistake, I don't know exactly. Anyway, there was a tumble dryer which ended up, a tumble dryer signature, which ended up in a washing machine channel, and which was part of the training data set. So that means uh, the algorithm was trained that this blue signature here, which is actually a tumble dryer, that it is a washing machine. And um, when I did some QA on the whole train data, I literally flipped through all the thousands of signatures, or like a lot of the signatures that we have, and I found this one here. And um, I thought, like, hey, let's look at what is the actual prediction on that. So it has been trained on this blue thing here being a washing machine, which is wrong. But if I feed it back now again to the algorithm and test on it, like, what's the result then going to be? And what's interesting here is that um, it does the correct thing. So the, uh, the first column here, shows the sort of the true value, which is said to be true. In this case, it's a bit wrong. But here we see 2.33 kilowatt hours in the washing machine channel. And Diana's prediction is 2.19 kilowatt hours in the tumble dryer channel, which is right. I thought like, this is really cool, because it shows that there is no overfitting going on. Like, I mean, it would be possible that that's always the thing that I'm most worried about when I, when I think about deep learning is we have like these millions of weights in there. And they might just pick up some totally Unpredictable crap, right? Some, uh, some, something totally irrelevant. And um, this, in this case, this mislabeled uh, signature was shown to the algorithm already thousands of times, and which has been, been perfectly possible. And would have learned, okay, this mislabeled uh, washing machine, uh, sorry, this mislabeled tumble dryer is actually a washing machine, which doesn't happen. And the same for a uh, washing machine that's mislabeled as a different here. So, just as an example, this gives me some confidence that also some maybe anecdotal confidence that the whole neural network, although it's difficult to really debug it, because you cannot look at, we don't really know what's going on there, we cannot look at all the weights, it seems to be doing something sensible. Um, then some comments on the computation requirements. So typically now for one set of training data, and for, some, for one set of uh, weights, or for one fun model, for one model, so when we just start training from scratch again, there's roughly two terabytes of train data that's being processed there. And um, training time is something roughly between one and three days. Um, so we rent the GPUs on AWS, which is uh, pretty convenient. So we can scale up more if we want to have to, and so on. And the other thing, which I think is also really, really convenient for us with these deep neural networks, is that the deployment scales very well. So it's in the end just a matrix multiplication, which you can also do on, uh, on GPUs. And it's uh, pretty performant. So uh, for one GPU, um, one GPU can do something between 100,000 and 1 million household days of breakdowns uh, per hour. Um, and that's pretty convenient. Because right now, um, yeah, I mean, there are more and more trials coming up. And more and more, also, which is very positive for us, more and more utilities that, utilities that, that are collecting this data at uh, higher frequencies, such that we can put this to use. So right now, it is. Uh, it's not only theory, this is actually in production and running all the time. So um, I think it's pretty good. So if you've get no, ever asked or ever wondered why uh, what self-driving cars have uh, <coughs> to, do, to do with electricity bills, then maybe you have a little bit better answer of that, but you know. Um, yes, so thank you for your attention. And um, if there are any questions, then I think we still have a couple of minutes.